Hi, and welcome to the 42nd in our Middle Eastern and North African Islamic history series, uh, where we talk about the Qajar decline. This is a direct follow-up to episode uh, 36, where we talked about the Qajar dynasty, and we'll cover some of the slides that we did not finish uh, in that episode. So for those who are unfamiliar, here are the rules. This is not an academic presentation. I am not uh, accredited in history, philosophy, religion, or any of the topics that we will be discussing today, um, but I will attempt to do so from a secular perspective. That said, there will certainly be religious issues uh, that we're going to discuss because it's the Middle East and that's almost inevitable. But um, let's observe Will Wheaton's law of don't be a dick, right? Be, be respectful, understanding, commensurate with the difficulty of the topic. That said, I love interactivity questions, comments, clarifications. Please put those in the chat. I do read the chat and respond in, in real time. I like to say that these presentations are a 101 and a 201. A 101 meaning that if you don't know anything, I'll catch you up. And a 201 meaning that if you know something, I'll probably tell you something you didn't know. When I put dates below a person, those are their years of service in whatever role they happen to have, be it as Shaw, as prime minister, as uh, general. Um, it's not the dates that they were born and died, although it can coincide with their death. Um, I have a two hour hard stop, which means that if at the end of two hours, I don't get to all my slides, that's okay. It'll just go uh, into the next week's presentation or the next applicable week's presentation. And this, like the other 41 episodes in the Middle Eastern North uh, African Islamic History series and the Crusade series and the European Union series and the Ancient Rome series, all of these series are recorded and this will be too and posted on our YouTube page or on omnicarta.org uh, where you can see all the episodes and actually understand this series in its continuity. So uh, people of course are missing the quiz where we see what you remember from last week. And in particular, question number one, which of the following describes Bulgaria's foreign relations from, 19, from 1875 to 1914? A, given the positive results of the Congress of Berlin of 1878 on Bulgarian aspirations, Bulgarians started a long-term German alliance that led them to join the central powers. B, Bulgaria consistently served as a Russian vassal in the Balkans and declared war on the Serbians when the latter attempted to lead Russian vassalhood. C, Bulgaria was first a Russian vassal, but became more independent after 1885. Then it became part of the Balkan League in 1912 before declaring war on them in 1913. D, Bulgaria maintained a strong alliance with Austria-Hungary since the Habsburg dynasty in Austria-Hungary was the traditional enemy of the Ottoman Empire. Any guesses? I have C. C is the uh, C is the correct answer. Uh, B is actually not true. Um, Bulgaria stopped being a Russian vassal when the Russians refused to recognize uh, the annexation of East Romania into Bulgaria and the actions by Stefan Stambulov uh, in creating a more independent and nationalistic Bulgaria. Um, and so the tensions with the Russians really um, came to a boiling point, especially when um, the Russians assassinated, I'm sorry, the Russians removed uh, the king, uh, the Knyaz of Bulgaria, um, and then the Bulgarians by military force uh, led by Matkorov uh, put together um, another pro-independence um, or pro-Austria-Hungary uh, leader in the empire. Um, A is false um, because even though they did join the, German, uh, the Germans and became part of the Central Powers, that was a direct result of the Second Balkan War in 1913. Um, and the Congress of Berlin was not advantageous to Bulgaria. In fact, it lost significant amounts of territory that it had aspired to control. And D is also false um, because uh, Bulgaria did not have a strong alliance with Austria-Hungary um, and Austria-Hungary had stopped being the traditional enemy of the Ottoman Empire midway through the 18th century when that role was usurped by Russia. And Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire actually became more conciliatory to each other, um, seeing Russia as the bigger threat to both. <laughs> 
Question number two, which of the following Balkan states actively participated in the Macedonian struggle? Choose all that apply. Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Albania, Romania, Greece, Bulgaria, the Ottoman Empire, and local Macedonians themselves. All right, seeing that there are no answers, um, the answers here are B, E, and F, and G, and H. Uh, Serbia, Greece, and Bulgaria, of course, were the primary uh, parties that were fighting over uh, the territory in Macedonia. But of course, the Ottoman Empire was the reigning country in control of the territory, and so they fought to maintain uh, control in their regions. And of course, local Macedonians uh, also fought heavily. In fact, in many cases, the forces of the Serbians, the Greeks, uh, and the Bulgarians were represented more by local Macedonians who happened to be Serbian, Greek, or Bulgarian aligned than by legitimate forces of those countries to avoid declaring an all-out war on the Ottoman Empire. We saw things like the Chetas from Serbia and, and Bulgaria, uh, Komitagis from Bulgaria, the Hellenic um, the Hellenic Macedonian Committee uh, and the Andartes from the Greeks. So we saw all of those sort of paramilitary organizations that uh, used a lot of local Macedonians. And question number three, which of the following describes the Bosnia crisis of 1909? A, Austria-Hungary changed from the de facto governors of Bosnia-Herzegovina to its de jure possessors, angering both the Serbians and the Ottomans. B, Bosniaks, uh, rallying behind several several local uh, yeah, Bosniaks rallying behind several local Bashibuzuks who rebelled against the Austro-Hungarian control and the ha Hungarian military under Kalai had to be brought in. C. Austria-Hungary threatened to expel all Serbians from its empire unless Serbia reinstated the Obrenovic dynasty, which had been overthrown in 1903. D. Albania sent soldiers into the Ottoman regions of Sanjak and Novi Pazar, preventing Austrian Anton von Vinso. Uh, from administering the region. Um, Mark, considering that you covered this last time, do you remember what the answer is? And Mark says A, and A is the correct answer. Yes, um, right. Uh, B is false. The Bosniaks did not revolt. Uh, they actually accepted uh, Austrian rule. They figured that it would actually, that it would be better for them then ruled by Serbia. Um, we also have uh, we also have C. Um, while it is true that the Obrenoviches were overthrown uh, in 1903 uh, by a military coup that put the Karadjordjeviches in power, um, Austria-Hungary never made a threat to expel Serbs from its empire. D is also false. In 1909, Albania was not an independent country. Remember, the Albanian revolts took place in 1910, 1911, and 1912, resulting in Albanian independence at the end of 1912. Um, and the Ottoman regions of Sanjak and Novi Pazar, um, while they were desired by many of the Albanian leaders, by that point, uh, they had come under Austrian control. Uh, so Anton von Vinso absolutely could rule that region. Um, and A is correct because that's what happened. Uh, as the comments note, um, a lot of this, uh, the relationship between Bosnia, Austria, and Serbia really laid the groundwork for the assassination of Gavrila Princip, um, and that created uh, the the powder, uh, the, the the spark that lit up World War One. All right. So in these last two weeks and this week, we have three different stories, right? We talked about uh, Abdul Hamid two weeks ago. Um, we talked about the Balkan Wars last week, and today we're talking about the Persian Constitution Revolution. Um, in each case, we're talking about really the same period of time um, in these related states. And so there is 
uh, crossover between those different countries, but it's really helpful to understand those situations on their own, given how complex and how multi-party they are. So similar to those Lord of the Rings, right, where you have the three tracks that are separate from each other, we're going to have those three tracks that are separate from each other. Um, so one of the things that we notice is that at, in the 19th century, up until the 20th century, um, Iran loses a key number of territories. Uh, in particular, when we think about episode 36 in this series, we talked about the losses uh, to the Russians in the Northwest, right? Those are the South Caucasian territories, the Eastern part of Georgia, uh, hist uh, historically known as Iberia, or modern country of Azerbaijan, the uh, southernmost region of Dagestan, which is a part of uh, the Russian Federation today, um, and the country of Armenia. Um, all those became part of Russia. And in the East, a lot of the territories that had historically been part of uh, Iran either became part of the expanding Russian Empire, the expanding British Empire, or the Kingdom of Afghanistan. Um, so to sort of remind us about what the story of Persia was, right, in 1501, uh, Safavid Shah Ismail um, was able to unite uh, the fractured territories uh, under his rulership and establish a Shiite autocratic state. Um, and that state uh, really uh, uh, ended up falling uh, when the Sunnis of Afghanistan uh, specifically the Ghilji uh, tribe of Pashtuns uh, invaded from, uh, from that territory uh, and besieged Isfahan, resulting in a great famine and the collapse of the Safavid government. Uh, Mirveis Hotak and his successor, um, uh, Mahmoud Hotaki, um, uh, began the Hotaki Empire, which didn't last very long uh, because it would then be overthrown by General Nadir Shah, um, Nadir Shah was a Turkic uh, leader, similar to how the Safavids had been Turkic as well, but he was from the Ash Afshar tribe, um, and he created a massive empire by launching expansionary wars in every direction. Uh, we talked about how damaging uh, those wars were in terms of the amount of casualties that Nadir Shah suffered, but at the same time, he was an innovative military commander um, and was able to uh, commit one of the greatest heists in history, uh, the theft of jewels from the Mughal Empire in uh, the Siege of Delhi of 1739. But after he died, um, Persia once again collapsed into a number of distinct uh, city-states and regions ruled by local chieftains, many of them um, being chieftains that had been loyal in some way to Nadir Shah um, during his power. The next group to unify Iran were the Zans. They didn't control all of Iran. You can see the Afsharids uh, controlled the areas in the Northeast uh, near the city of Mashhad. Um, but um, Karim Khan uh, was able by leading the Bakhtiari tribes, um, he was able to assert control uh, over the country and effectively rule um, the majority of Iran from his city of Shiraz. But his successors were less effective in doing so. And so Lutf Ali Khan was defeated um, by the alliance between Haji Ibrahim Shirazi, the, uh, the mayor um, of Shiraz, and Agha Muhammad Khan of the Qajars, um, who in a number of incredibly horrendous battles, like um, the Battle of Kerman, where Following the defeat, uh, Agha Muhammad Khan uh, blinded all 20,000 of the male population. Um, the Qajars were able to secure control of Iran, and after the Battle of Kurtsanisi, were able to control the uh, the Caucasian provinces as the Caucasian provinces as well. We also discussed that in the 18th century, um, there was a huge debate within the Iranian world um, as to how Shiite Islam should be organized. And this debate was between the Akhbaris and the Usulis. The Akhbaris really believing that um, 
believing something closer to Protestantism within the Christianity or within Christianity in this idea that people can access the sources, people can ask secular questions, people can resolve cultural issues. All of these things um, are within the hands of the local population and that cultural Iranian Islam is a general guide for conduct uh, that leaves a lot of room for individual interpretations, whereas the Usulis uh, argue that there should be marja e taqlid, uh, objects of emulation. Uh, these are uh, Islamic scholars who are well versed uh, in the traditional um, information. And so um, these leaders would uh, attract to themselves a following of traditional pious individuals, um, as well as common lay people who would take their opinions as gospel. And of course, the Usulis won. Uh, this debate between uh, the Akbaris and the Usulis. So we enter the 19th century with the Usulis firmly in command of Iraq, Iran's Shiite community. And at this point, right, as we move into the 19th century, we're moving into the great game where Iran is juxtaposed between two uh, powerful expanding empires. One, of course, is the Russian empire based in St. Petersburg and expanding in all directions uh, in Asia. Um, and the other is the British Empire with its holdings in India, expanding further north and west uh, towards the southern, uh, southern and eastern uh, borders of Iran. By the end of the Great Game, right, we have occupation zones within Iran itself um, held by these two great powers. And so we had a Qajar period where the Qajars following the death of Agha Muhammad Khan, uh, they reverted to a traditional style of Persian governance, which is to allow uh, the local population to govern itself um, as sort of a number of confederal entities under the Persian Shah. And this uh, solved a number of problems, right? It avoided returning to civil wars. One of the things that we should always mention when we talk about Nader Shah is that he put down dozens of revolts against his rule. Um, because he tried to unify Persia into a singular state. And so the Qajars had taken that lesson um, and decided not to unify into one central state. Unfortunately, this had direct consequences in that when the Russians tried to invade uh, in, 18, uh, in 1804, um, led by um, Georgian Russian Pavel Tsitsianov, the Russians were able to make significant advances uh, into the Caucasus and defeat uh, the Persians quite decisively. You can see in the Treaty of Gulistan, which was signed uh, in 1813, significant portions of the Persian Caucasus, um, most of what is today uh, Azerbaijan, the eastern parts of Georgia and some parts of Armenia um, became part of Russia as well as uh, the Caspian Sea becoming a Russian lake. We know that from this period that there was a lot of repression by the Russians of the indigenous Caucasian population, um, numerous hangings and extirpations in order to solidify Russian control of the region. And that effectively led to the, uh, the wars against all of the Caucasian peoples and you have a number of successive Caucasian leaders who were involved in that, right? We talked about Kuzbech Tokhrizhiko. Wow, my circation is really off today. Kuzbech uh, um, who, who you can see in the upper right-hand side, he was one of the first rebel leaders um, fighting directly against Alexei Yermolov. Um, After he uh, passed, um, the reins went to Imam Shamil um, from the Dagestani um, population. And we see a lot of Russian Cossacks moving into the region and uh, beginning an informal war uh, against the Caucasians who were living in Alls, which were fortified mountain villages that were very difficult to take. But regardless, by 1867, um, you had significant portions of the Caucasian population either exterminated or expelled, right? Uh, that's the Circassian genocide. In 1828, there was another war, this time instigated by the Persians themselves against the Russians as a reaction to Yermolov's barbaric practices 
and the Russians prevailed once again, forcing further concessions from the Persians. There's a question of what was the main interest of the British and the Russians in conquering Persia? There are several different things. The, uh, the first thing is that from the from both perspectives, uh, conquest of territory and of people lent prestige to those various empires. So that's, that's number one. But number two is that Russia was expanding in all directions and the Russian people were multiplying at a quite prodigious rate. And so there was always this concept that the Russians needed more space, more territory for their population and for the expanding trade that that population would engage in. From the British perspective, uh, there was a lot of interest in Iran because of its position protecting the borders of British India. Um, in order for anyone to make an overland attack into British India, they would either need to surmount uh, the Himalayas, right? Come, if you're coming from the Chinese direction, the Hindu Kush, if, if you're coming from the Afghan direction, or the much more traversable border uh, of Iran and Pakistan. And so there was always an interest from the British side to have an alliance with the Iranians in order to prevent uh, in incursions through that Iran-Pakistan border. There's also the idea that the Persians were a civilization that was ripe for colonization. And in fact, had the British and, and Russians not been opposing each other, uh, Iran could easily have been uh, partitioned or colonized during this period. Um, but their opposition to each other gave uh, the Persians uh, the leverage they needed in order to modernize to a certain degree their military. One of the Russian requirements uh, of the Treaty of, of uh, Turkmen Shai, in addition to the territory it took, was the return of captives, which is a misleading title. In many, of, in many cases, during Persian offensives, Christians had been taken, both Armenians and uh, Georgians um, had been taken um, and converted to Islam and married to Persian men. Um, but by the time that the Treaty of Turkmen Shai had intervened, many of these women had more or less accepted their fate. Um, they had children, they had families, and a lot of them uh, did not want to be returned, nor did many Persians consider it the Russian right uh, to take uh, these lawfully acquired captives. So we end up having when the Russian uh, embassy gives shelter to a few of these Armenians um, requesting asylum, um, you have a storming of the Russian embassy as mullahs um, uh, encourage this negative view towards Russia, um, taking power uh, away from Iranians in order to determine the Iranian future. One of the interesting uh, contrasts between this embassy storming and the more famous storming of the American embassy in the wake of the Islamic revolution in 1979 um, was that the Iranian Qajar Shahs immediately um, presented to the Russian government an apology for, uh, for the attack on the embassy in presenting the Shah diamond, which is currently still uh, held by the Russian government. It's one of the largest diamonds in the world. So we then move into the 1830s and 1840s under Muhammad Shah. Muhammad Shah was, generally speaking, a rather passive ruler. He didn't really want to rock the boat or change things too much. And so you see him taking very little action um, contrary to the Russians who were uh, beginning to uh, control more and more policy uh, following the Treaty of Turkmenshai. Um, and at the same time, because of the connection that Russians were making, the inroads that they were making, we see a vast number of textile imports coming from Russia and a smaller percentage coming from Britain uh, into Iran, uh, making uh, Iranian uh, economic development begin to stall. The Iranians couldn't manufacture at the same rate and with the same uh, technologies as the British or the Russians, 
And this led to increasing economic despair and uh, economic difficulties uh, in the Persian Empire. Now, at this point, the British um, had begun to turn Afghanistan into a vassal. And so part of Russian pressure And there's a question of uh, if the Persian textiles could compete with Indian textiles. Uh, by and large, we didn't have uh, large scale trade between non-British India, right? Because there's some parts in the 1830s that are not controlled by the British, uh, between non-British India and Persia. There was certainly some trade, but most textiles in Iran were made in Iran. And so the imports uh, were primarily coming from Europe as uh, more and more treaties were passed, uh, allowing those Europeans access to Persian markets. Part of Russia's uh, pressure um, during Muhammad Shah's reign was to encourage him to attack Herat. Now Herat was a city in the Western part of Afghanistan, it's still in West Afghanistan today, but it was historically a part of the Persian empire. And so this fed into a lot of irredentism within the Persian empire. And would be a way for the Russians to backdoor an entry into, into India through the Hindu Kush mountains. So those preparations were made for the siege of Herat. Um, the British responded by launching an amphibious invasion on the Iranian coast near the city of Bushehir. Um, and that amphibious invasion uh, resulted in the Persian, Persians withdrawing from Herat. It's an interesting strategy by the British Right, because they could have invaded Afghanistan itself, but they didn't want to um, cause problems with the Afghan government. And also those territories are very mountainous and remote. By contrast, launching an amphibious assault and forcing the Persians to concede the war in the East um, was a novel strategy. In fact, um, the British wanted to uh, control the future of Afghanistan. Um, and so they intervened in a number of dynastic struggles within the Afghan polity. You can see, for example, Dost Muhammad Khan, um, when he was elected for the first time, he resisted British control. Um, after the British uh, fought, including a very difficult battle to uh, win the city of Ghazni in 1839, um, the British installed their own ruler, but eventually Dost Muhammad Khan uh, was able to take power again. But when he did so, he realized that a confrontation with the British would not be advantageous. And so he became a lukewarm ally uh, of the British and allowed the British to expand their sphere of influence into Afghanistan. We talked about last time that uh, episode 36, that there was a lot of discrimination against the Jews of Iran and in particular, uh, there was the issue of Najis, that Jews were considered ritually unclean. They couldn't uh, physically touch um, Persian Muslims or they would get uh, that uncleanliness onto the Persians. Uh, for those who are familiar with um, Jewish religious terms, this term Najis in Islam is parallel to Tame uh, in Judaism, this kind of ritual impurity. Um, we also see during the 1830s numerous um, uh, numerous acts of discrimination against the Jews. Uh, particularly famous is the, uh, the Allah Dad incident, which took place in the city of Mashhad in northeastern Iran uh, in 1839, where the Jews were discriminated against, some of them forcibly converted to Islam. Um, those that were forcibly converted were called Jadidis. And so you can see these are some Jewish, uh, ex-Jewish Jadidis. Uh, they're nominally Muslim uh, after the Allah Dad. You have uh, mullahs inciting this kind of violence, but you also have mullahs standing against this. And one of the things that we're going to see, and it's rather consistent all the way through Iranian history into the present day, is that the mujtahids, uh, these Iranian um, religious leaders who are setting examples, these mujtahids um, sit on all sides of the political uh, spectrum on different issues, including on the Jewish issue. Uh, there are and there are certainly mujtahids who have a negative a view towards Jews, and there are other ones who have a much more positive view, much more accepting view towards them. We also talked about how you have the Baha'i uh, religion beginning to form during the 1840s and 1850s, 
Um, and the Baha'i religion is a post-Islamic religion, and it's post-Islamic because it admits to prophecy after Muhammad, right? Muhammad is supposed to be the capstone in Islam. Um, it also is syncretic. It takes on some ideas from uh, Indic religions and is based thoroughly on the concept of Baltinia, that the world that exists is an appearance, and that appearance belies the true nature of the world. Um, that the true nature of the world is what's worth understanding. And a, and a person who can connect with the world um, in, its, uh, in its clearest form um, is actually able to achieve spiritual enlightenment. We talked about also something that's really important uh, for today, which is that you have attempts within Persia to modernize. It's not, uh, it's not only that um, the, uh, the British and the Russians constrain uh, Persian growth, which they generally, gen generally do, but there are attempts by Persians to develop um, a more modern society in the 19th century. For example, you can see Mirza Taghi Khan Farhani, um, and he was known by his um, moniker Amir Kabir, or Big Prince, um, and he did a number of things, right? He reviewed the finances, he rearranged the pensions, uh, he built a polytechnic school, um, he improved the agrarian economy, he began uh, building manufacturing plants. Uh, within his, in his three years of administration, um, he was able to achieve numerous um, incredibly difficult modernization reforms. That said, the fact that he cut the pensions of many of the courtiers and also managed to alienate the British and the Russians uh, by making a more independent-minded Iran um, led to his execution. Um, and Nasruddin Shah, um, following Amir Kabir, only had um, status quo type leaders. To put in perspective how bad this was, by the mid 1870s, Iran had one train line and that train line went for literally five kilometers within what is today the city of Tehran. At that time, um, the, the shrine of Shah Abdul Azim was outside the borders of um, outside the borders of the city of Tehran, um, but now it's within the city. And that was the only uh, train line that existed uh, because of so many attempts by the British and the French uh, to promote these uh, grand viziers who would effectively do nothing as the, British and Ru as the British and Russians consolidated their hold in the various parts of the country where they operated. Similarly um, to the war in 1838, the Russians again instigated um, the Persians to enter into Afghanistan. Um, I have a question of, can you talk about the laws that exempted all foreign citizens from Iranian jurisdiction after the 1828 capitulations? Um, extraterritoriality laws um, began in 1828, as you point out. And these kinds of laws meant that Russians and British who were living uh, inside of Iran were subject to different legal codes. They, uh, they would be removed from Iran in the case of issue and they would be tried in their home countries. Um, you also saw it as incredibly difficult to launch complaints uh, against, the, uh, against um, Russians and British. Um, but the bigger issue would, uh, was the one that I pointed out, which is that captives who had been taken, um, converted to Islam uh, and brought into large Iranian society, the Russians had the ability to uncaptive them, for want of a better term, to return them to the places that they were taken from. But in many cases, as I said, they had been there for decades at this point. And so their world was the one where they had been already been taken. But uh, getting back to the Anglo-Persian War of 1856 to 1857, um, the Russians, once again, um, they had been working with the modernization of Persian soldiers that had started with Amir Kabir um, and had continued even with many of um, the more lukewarm on progress uh, Grand Viziers. Uh, so you had a modern Persian army. And so the Persians, once again, um, attacked Herat um, the Herat Citadel 
um, was finally breached. And um, additionally, in the Battle of Khashab, uh, which was the biggest single battle, the Persians won an astounding victory over the Afghans. Um, but uh, similarly to last time, the British uh, launched an amphibious invasion through, uh, uh, through Bushehir, and again forced the Persians to withdraw from Afghanistan. Um, and this, of course, uh, led to Dost Muhammad having a more favorable view of the British following this war. We then start with the Reuter concession. And the Reuter concession really shows a fundamental change in the way that the British uh, and Russians were going to operate, but more so the British, um, in terms of how they were going to operate within Iran. These concessions were based on the massive amounts of debt that the Iranians owed foreign governments. Many of the Shahs were excessive spenders um, and their regimes had incredible monetary outlays for very minimal progress. Many of that, much of that money going to uh, luxurious items owned by courtiers. And so you had a massive amount of debt. Business people uh, seized on that debt, um, paying off some of it in exchange for a monopolistic trade concession. And, and the Reuter concession is just one of these. So um, Baron Paul, uh, Julius von Reuter, who was a German Jew living in the United Kingdom. Um, he got a concession um, for the possibility of building railroads uh, throughout Iran. Um, and he paid a significant amount up front in order to be able to do this. Um, throughout the country, however, many mullahs saw, um, saw this uh, kind of concession that would give so much power to a foreigner, and especially that foreigner being a Jew, um, incredibly deleterious and argued that it was satanic um, for, um, for all of this concession to be given up. And so the concession uh, after a few years in 18, uh, in, uh, yeah, so in the mid 1870s, um, the concession was changed. And while, uh, Reuter was never given his money back. He was allowed to start the Imperial Bank of Persia, which was given an exclusive concession to print banknotes uh, within Iran. And this ended up uh, making uh, von Reuter relatively wealthy, not as wealthy as he would have been if he had built the railroads, but relatively wealthy. This, by the way, is the same Reuter who was responsible for founding the news agency. Um, and he, a lot of the money that he used to pour into this concession came from his successes uh, in news, uh, news collection. So going back to the great game, we see a lot of Russian expansion during this period as Russia moves into Central Asia. Now, Russian moves into Central Asia are very different in many respects to the way that they move through the Caucasus. There were a number of states uh, littered throughout Central Asia. Um, there's the state of Khiva, the state of Bukhara, the state of Khojand, um, many of these um, in what is today Uzbekistan or in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. The Cossacks had already become part of the Russian Empire as early as 1600, but uh, the states in Uzbekistan and further south um, were at least nominally uh, independent kingdoms. The way that the Russians uh, entered was through a combination of military, uh, military uh, effectiveness and diplomacy. In fact, many of the regions that were conquered in what is today Uzbekistan had their taxes defrayed, had conscription, which was a huge issue in European Russia, um, held off for, uh, for several decades until Russian rule could become more normalized. At the same time, the British, through their relationship with Afghanistan, uh, managed to create a functional border. But increasingly, as the British moved further south, even getting to the city of Merv in 1884, the British were concerned that the Russians would be able to get to uh, British India. So part of those Russian conquests you can see there. The Russians began to build extensive railroads um, throughout 
uh, uh, throughout the country. You can see this is the port at Uzunada. Uh, Uzunada is in modern day Turkmenistan, um, close to the city of Turkmen uh, sorry, close to the city of Turkmen Bashi today. Um, and it runs into the heart of Turkmenistan. Um, you can actually see on the right-hand side, those are uh, Russian forces at shahr e -Sabz. shahr e -Sabz was the ancient capital of Timur, and the Russians, of course, sent um, numerous archaeologists uh, to work on those ruins uh, in order to understand better Central Asian civilization. Within the Russian, within the European part of the Russian Empire, there was a strong interest. Uh, there was a strong interest in uh, what was going on in Central Asia. Uh, to uh, all kinds of Orientalism within Russia, all, uh, a desire for uh, products made in Samarkand, products made in, in Bukhara, um, in order to uh, connect with that uh, Orientalism and Oriental feeling. Now, there were attempts to convert the population to Christianity, but these were generally uh, very lightly done because of how much tact the Russian government needed in order to control these provinces that were so far away from the capital and so prone to resisting. The Russian expansion into Merv was particularly scary uh, to the British, right, as we pointed out, because Merv is so close to the border with Afghanistan. And in fact, the Russians actually crossed um, uh, the local rivers into Afghanistan in what's called the Panjde incident of 1885. Um, the Russians crossed over into Afghanistan. Uh, the British and Afghan soldiers on the far side pushed the Russians out. And after about a few days, the Russians and British agreed um, that the river that separates Afghanistan uh, from Turkmenistan would serve as the border uh, between the Russian Empire and the uh, Kingdom of Afghanistan, which would remain in the British sphere. In fact, the Russians agreed that they would not make any more southward advances following the annexation of Merv. That said, that didn't stop the Russian influence within Persia. And one of the things that the Russians did was they set up the Persian Cossacks. Now, um, let's be clear about the Persian Cossacks. The Russian Cossacks that had originally existed were, um, no, uh, were Russian nomadic people who had been, uh, or sorry, Russian settlers who'd been sort of dumped uh, into the edges of the empire, given guns and sort of made their own Wild West coalition of soldiers. The Persian Cossacks were called that not because they had any similarity uh, to that kind of development, but because um, they wore the uniforms and outfits typical of Cossacks, and the Russians use, uh, also use that term as a part of um, as a part of general diplomacy uh, in order to create a sense that Persia was now increasingly in the Russian sphere. Um, there's a question of, can I say that in general, there were two imperial powers fighting for expansion into the area? During the period of the Great Game, it's absolutely the case that it's the British and the Russians fighting for expansion in here. As we move into the 20th century, Germany and the Ottoman Empire are also interested in expansion into Persia. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So those Persian Cossacks um, become the most effective troops within um, the Persian Empire. They are the best trained, and they also uh, are led by Russian commanders, which gives the Russians a certain, an incredible degree of control over the highest degrees of Iranian uh, government. So now the concessions became increasingly more numerous and increasingly more detested as we move into the 1890s. Uh, in particular, this is, uh, there was the Imperial Tobacco Corporation because they had a tobacco concession for all of, uh, all of Iran, similar to other concessions as they were monopolistic. And so it put every single Persian uh, maker of those um, entities out of business. And it 
got to such a point that there were so many riots that the, that the mujtahids began to weigh in as well. And so you can see Grand Ayatollah Muhammad Hassan Ashirazi. And Ashirazi um, was very much attuned to the situation in the Grand Bazaar with the merchants um, dealing with these, uh, dealing with these uh, prohibitions uh, leveled by the Persian government, right? Because the Persian government is the one giving these concessions leveled by the Persian government against its own citizens. And he declares a fatwa against the, uh, against the use of all tobacco. This is, this is the actual fatwa he wrote. Um, and the fatwa was so widely observed that even in the Shah's harem, um, the wives refused to smoke. Um, that should give you an idea about how much influence, uh, these uh, these mujtahids actually have, and so much pressure was put on uh, on Nasiruddin Shah that he actually cancelled uh, the concession and got an incredible amount of ire from the British for having done so. That said, Nasiruddin Shah was seen by many Persians as being ineffective, and in particular. Uh, he was seen as ineffective by Jamal al-Din Afghani, who you can see in the upper left-hand side. Now, Jamal al-Din Afghani is probably the clearest distiller in the Persian context of what's called Islamic modernism. And we've seen Islamic modernism before. We haven't named it as such, uh, but we've seen it before in the likes of Namik Kemal on, on the side of the young Ottomans. We talked about him in episode um, 33. Um, and uh, Rifat Tatawi who we uh, talk, talked about in episode 30 in the Egyptian context. And, in, and the general understanding of Islamic modernism is that Islamic modernism tries to see a balance uh, between Islam as a religion uh, in terms of its political role and the, and the objective of a modern westernized state, right? Because the general conception of modern westernized state is a secular one. Um, the Islamic modernists don't see it as a secular institution. So if we compare it to what it's not, it becomes a little bit clearer what it is. So if you compare it to secularism, Jamal al-Din Afghani believed that science, innovation, technology, and development were key in creating a modern nation state. And those developments in the West that could lead to better uh, science, uh, better organization, development, and so on, should be integrated uh, into the Persian context. Now, Jamal al-Din Afghani was unsure whether or not a constitution would be useful. Um, Right, that's sort of on the border between uh, one of these technological advances, which is clearly desirable, and secularism, which clearly isn't. But the Islamic modernists saw a place for Islam as either on the most religious side, like Jamal al-Din Afghani, um, for, uh, an implementation of the Sharia, or on the most lenient side, like in Namik Kemal, as sort of a spirit of enjoy, of creating a moral compass for legislation, um, Islam should be a part of the state. Now they disagree with Islamists. And again, when we get into the more modern context in the 20th century, we'll talk a lot more about Islamism, but they would disagree with the Islamists in that they don't want a theocracy and they don't see that religious leaders should be the ones ruling. They only believe that religion should create a positive influence in the way that laws are constructed and part of the identity of the country, more so than a empowerment of religious leaders. So there's a question of, um, do the Islamic modernists want a separation of church and state? Absolutely not. The Islamic modernists believe that Islam should be the official religion of a Muslim majority state and Islam should give color to the laws of that state. It just happens that Islam should not be the only thing giving color to those laws. Now, Jamal al-Din Afghani uh, published numerous documents criticizing Nasr al-Din Shah um, for not standing up to the Western powers, um, in this case, both Britain and Russia, and um, making a mockery out of uh, the Persian state. For that, of course, he was uh, forced to live in exile. And he and while he was in Istanbul, he met Mirza Reza Kermani, who was also an Islamic modernist. And the two of them spent a significant amount of time talking about the possibility of creating an Islamic modernist state in Iran. Uh, 
To that end, Mirza Reza Kermani um, went to the um, the Shah Abdul Azim shrine, and there Nasruddin Shah was. There's a question here, um, though nominally secular, modern Western development is heavily dependent on various Christian infused lenses. Is that ad hoc Christianity at root of the tension with various Muslim countries, including Iran? Um, I would say no. I would actually say it's the opposite. Um, in many Muslim, if we're talking about today, um, many Muslim majority countries are much more sympathetic um, to the US as a political model uh, than the than, for example, France as a political model. And the reason for that is that the United States is a religious country. It's not religious in terms of its founding documentation, right? The constitution explicitly says um, the state shall have no official religion and all the citizens shall be able to practice whatever religion they want. But um, most of the people of the United States are religious people and there is a religious inspiration to a lot of the laws and issues that are currently being debated. In France, by contrast, that hard line of secularism where religion is completely out of the public square is incredibly threatening um, to, many, uh, to many people in the Islamic world who see some degree of Islamic modernism as part of the direction their country should go, where Islam has some kind of influence, but it's not necessarily the only influence. And, uh, and Islam should be an Islam that is modern in the sense of it embraces technology, science, and development. Um, at this time, um, if we're talking about the late 1900s, Christianity was much more aggressive in the Middle East in the in the 1900 in the, sorry in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, there were many more missionaries, and they were supported by the aegis of uh, of those powerful states. In the case of uh, Iran, it was the British and and um, and the Russians. In fact, we have numerous Orthodox conversions going on throughout. Um, the Russian-controlled Caucasus. Um, we have uh, pr uh, Protestants, uh, Protestant evangelists coming in with the British during this period. And so Christianity was, the issue with Christianity was not its, its lenses or its values, but that it was actually targeting Muslims for conversion. Um, whether Christianity was important in the foundation of laws in other countries, most Iranians probably wouldn't be terribly interested in that question. So as I was saying earlier, um, uh, Nasruddin Shah was at the shrine of Abdul Azim, um, was at the shrine of Abdul Azim, and at that shrine, um, uh, Mirza Reza Kermani saw an opportunity to kill Nasruddin Shah. Now, similar to the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which we with which you may be more familiar. Um, nearly everything that could go wrong went wrong um, from, the from the perspective of how do assassinations work. Um, uh, Mirza Reza Kermani's uh, gun was rusty. Um, Nasruddin Shah forgot to wear his overcoat, um, even though it was the, uh, yeah, forgot to wear his overcoat. Um, uh, Nasruddin Shah had um, avoided his security detail walking in front of them. Basically, if any of those things had been different, Kermani would not have been able to assassinate uh, Nasruddin Shah. He had to be at point blank range uh, for the shot to work and um, uh, Nasruddin Shah had to be completely unprotected, which he was. Now, one of the interesting wrinkles of Kermani's assassination is that it shows how Kermani understood the role of Islam and the minority religions in the state. Um, there, what he he writes in his uh, journals that on the eighth day of the Jewish festival of Passover, um, he was in the park um, where those Jews were having their uh, their picnic and. Nasruddin Shah was there, Mirza Reza Kermani actually had a more effective means of assassinating uh, the Shah there, a more likely uh, trajectory of success. Um, but he did not take the opportunity because he knew that riots would start 
um, after he killed the Shah, and he didn't want the Jews in any way connected with his attempts uh, to bring down the government, um, which shows to a certain degree um, a liberalism despite the fact that he's a reactionary assassin. So this is the time when the Persian Cossacks really come to be developed. Um, and they're developed in the wake um, of Nasruddin Shah's last days. Um, and when Nasruddin Shah dies, Vladimir Kosogovsky um, is the Russian general in charge of these Cossacks. And they're the ones who maintain order, um, preventing the development of a more modern state uh, with the assassination in 1896. What What's worth pointing out is that the Persian Cossacks uh, were created through the relationship between Amina Sultan, whose birth name was Mirza Ali Al Asghar, um, Mirza Ali Asghar Khan, um, and the Russians. So, uh, so that relationship. Um, developed the Cossacks on the original level. And the original level was that it would be made of 500 individuals. Most of these uh, individuals were what were called muhajirs or emigrants. Uh, who, uh, most of these fleeing the Caucasus from the Russian invasion, right? Circassians, um, Avars, um, Turks, all these different groups. And they were brought together into the Persian Cossacks. Um, with Amina Sultan's assistance, uh, they were expanded to, uh, to 1500 and not too soon uh, because they protected the new Shah from taking, uh, they protected the new Shah, allowing him to take power and keeping peace within Iran um, during this period. Now, as the Cossacks expanded and they'll continue to expand um, throughout the history of Iran, in fact, the zenith will be in the 1920s. Um, more Persians were brought in. Um, and so you began to have a bifurcation within the Persian Cossacks between the Muhajirs, who were the more senior commanders in many cases, and these new Persian soldiers who were the dominant ethnicity of the country. And the a lot of the issues when controlling the Cossacks happened to do with the issue that a lot of Cossacks did not want to lose, a lot of the Muhajirs did not want to lose their um, special privileges that they had had when they were the first, uh, when they were the first Cossacks. And so um, it became increasingly difficult for the Persian government to actually control these entities. But as I said, the Persian Cossacks assured that um, Muzaffar Adin Shah, you can see him in the middle of the picture with that almost whisker-like mustache. Uh, he, there he is in the Parc de l'Etablissement, which is very close, which is in Paris. Uh, it's a spa. And Muzaffar Adin Shah, when he took power, was very old, right? Um, as one of the commenters pointed out, uh, Nasser Adin Shah ruled for nearly 50 years. Um, and so his successor was nearly as old as he was. He went to Europe numerous times for medical treatments as well as luxurious traveling which ended up bankrupting uh, much of the coffers. Um, there's a question of when I say the Persian government, uh, who do they really represent? The Persian government, I'm talking about the Qajar dynasty, right, which is a Turkic dynasty from, um, from the northern part of Iran. And the Qajars um, are ruling as absolute monarchs. And so the government are those who are loyal to the Qajars. Um, it is not a representative government. It is not a multi. It is a multi-ethnic government to the extent that there are multiple ethnicities there, but it is not multi-ethnic in the sense that the ethnicities are represented as ethnicities. So that's what I mean when I say the Persian government. Now, Muzaffar Adin Shah um, was spending uh, significant amounts of money. Um, in his role uh, as Shah, taking all of these luxury vacations to Europe and also the luxuries that he wanted to live with when he was in Iran. That said, he did have from time to time uh, progressive prime ministers um, 
probably the most famous was Amina Dawla. Uh, his birth name was Mirza Ali Khan. And Amina Dawla um, was very famous for putting together educational systems in Iran, especially girls' schools. Now, many of these girls' schools were attacked by the Shah, I'm sorry, were attacked by the Mujtahids um, as, uh, like, for example, we're going we're to talk about Flazlola Nuri. He considered them to be brothels um, and that girls should not receive an education. Um, Amina Dawla also um, began a number of infrastructure reforms, um, but unfortunately, um, as you can see from his dates, he wasn't in power very long. He was removed relatively quickly. One of the biggest developments that he'd made was the creation of the customs administration. He needed a way to balance the budget. Um, and uh, in order to do that, he wanted to create a customs administration that would force imports to be more taxed. And so he appointed Belgian Joseph Naus um, in order to run uh, that uh, customs enforcement. Now, in addition, um, sorry, there's a question here. When he, when, when the Cossack Brigade was modernizing, uh, did he get to choose between the British and the Russians or were the Russians the only option? Well, the Russians were the ones who maintained the sphere of influence in the North, right? And Tehran is in the North. And so it really became uh, a Russian developed uh, entity. And the Russians were much more often in the court in, in, in both Tabriz um, and in Tehran, both northern cities. The British did create um, militias of, uh, of Persians um, in the south, and like, for example, the, the South Rifles, um, the Persian South Rifles, but um, by and large, those come a lot later and are never as fundamental to the governance of Iran as the, um, as the Cossacks are. Now, one of the other things is that Muzaffar Adin Shah, uh, when he was in Paris, he was invited to see the cinematograph, which was a, uh, an early French uh, movie making device. It showed moving pictures. Um, it had no sound, of course. Um, moving pictures with sound only uh, really started in the 1920s. But Muzaffar Adin Shah was amazed by this product and spent an inordinate amount of money to buy all of the necessary implements to bring to Iran, reverse engineer it, and in many ways, this gave rise to Persian cinema, which would dominate uh, significant portions of the Middle East in the 1920s and 1930s. That's, uh, but despite this, Muzaffar Adin Shah had his critics and he had his critics from both the liberal side, right? Those are the ones who want uh, a constitution, a representative government um, and uh, developments along a westernized European model. Um, to create a national Iranian country, and those who are on the Muslim modernist side, on the more conservative side, who want uh, the government to uh, be promulgating new laws, investigating science, technology, and development, um, while still protecting Islam. Um, Muzaffar ad din Shah, because of his Francophilia, because of his uh, lack of direct governance in opposition to the Russians or in opposition to the British and solidification of an Iranian national state alienated both these groups, which began to move against him. Now, one of the particular issues that uh, people are very familiar with when it comes to Iran is the question of oil, uh, in particular in the Middle East. And this is really where it begins in 1901 with the Darcy concession. So you can see William Knox Darcy. William uh, Darcy was a miner. Um, in Australia. Um, and he had a long history of opening and controlling large uh, mineral deposit extraction. And so he saw the amount of debt that Muzaffar ad-Din Shah had managed to acquire and um, was willing to pay 20,000 pounds up front, 20,000 um, pounds following the completion of the concession. Um, and provide um, revenues uh, as a percentage based on what he had on earth um, in exchange for a full concession. And you can see that he got permission to drill for numerous um, minerals, including oil, uh, across the vast majority of 
uh, Persian territory. In fact, he intentionally excluded the region of Khorasan because of how close it was to Russian-controlled Turkmenistan. Now, um, Darcy began to drill for oil and other minerals throughout Iran, um, starting in the region of Kerman Shah, which is in the Northwest. Um, and those, and that area um, did not have much in the way of minerals. In fact, William Knox Darcy spent more than 160 million pounds of his own money um, trying from 1901 until 1908, trying to find some bit of uh, mineral wealth in order to justify um, this vast concession. And in fact, he went, uh, he went so poor that he had to get outside investors. Yeah, that he had to get outside investors like, um, like Burma Oil and um, the British Admiralty to uh, provide, and he had to give them shares in his uh, company in order to uh, continue funding for the drilling. And in fact, they were literally in 1908 sending the letter to cancel all future excavations. When in Masjid Soleiman, um, they hit liquid gold, right? Black gold. Um, and in Masjid Soleiman, in the region of Khuzestan, which is southwestern Iran, an Arab, um, an Arab region, uh, there are there are there is a significant Persian population there as well, um, but uh, the region is known for its Arab tribal inhabitants. Um, he struck that uh, petroleum and the Anglo-Persian oil company was formed. The Anglo-Persian oil company survives to this day. It went through several changes. When Persia became Iran, it became rebranded as the Anglo-Iranian oil company. And after um, it was expelled from Iran in 1979, it became known as BP or British, uh, British Petroleum. So um, as soon as liquid gold was uh, discovered and um, a number of oil pipelines were built uh, leading to the Abadan refinery um, in 1911. So it's only three years from the discovery to this to the creation of this refinery, which was one of the biggest in the world and allowed for the exportation of Iranian oil uh, to the British. This of course begins the long saga of expropriation that occurred within the Iranian context. And for those who are familiar with the events of 1949 to 1953, right, when we're going to cover this eventually, um, that had to do with the terms of this oil concession, the Darcy concession, that the Iranians felt that they weren't being properly compensated for the oil that was being extracted from their territory uh, under the concession, leading to the Shah being forced out in 51, and then the Shah being put back by the British in 1953 with American help. So the British were increasingly angry with the fact that the Russians were able to um, provide loans uh, to the uh, government in Tehran and also increasingly consolidate their power with the Cossacks, which led to the British paying bribes to a number of mujtahids in order to begin riots in the country. One of the mujtahids who received these British bribes was Syed Abdullah Behbehani, who you can see there. And he's actually going to be very important. We're going to talk about him a lot. These riots took place in Isfahan and in Yazd. Um, you can see Yazd there. Um, and these riots um, became increasingly directed at, uh, at the Tehran government for uh, its excesses, um, especially when it came to Muzaffaruddin Shah's spending. Additionally, there were tax increases all throughout the country, um, and the and the customs also created an additional tax. Since many Iranians were buying imported goods, um, the 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 people generally um, were more and more infuriated, um, and the excuse to rebel and to revolt uh, was well taken. 
Another thing that Iranians paid note to was the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, because this war was a game changer um, in, uh, for many uh, Iranians in the sense of Western countries, uh, sorry, European country like Russia was defeated by a non-European country, Japan. And so that gave uh, a lot of Persians the idea that they could rise up and create their own country, establish their own future. And during this period, the Russians actually provided a loan for 350,000 uh, British pounds, and the Iranian government rejected it uh, because of how many strings came attached with it in light of these protests. So as we move into 1905, we start seeing more and more riots occurring. In particular, you have a number of laws against price hikes. But because of the 1905 revolt in Russia following the Russo-Japanese War and the amount of trade that Iran had been doing with Russia, many imports became increasingly expensive for merchants to sell. And so those merchants raised their prices. This came headlong in collision with a number of the governors of the various provinces who did not want to raise prices because they knew that that would result in more riots, like we saw in Isfahan and Yazd. And so we had a situation that began um, another riot in 1905, which were the beatings of the sugar merchants. Two merchants, um, in fact, one of them who had been responsible for the restoration of the marketplace in Tehran, very well respected in the community. Both of these merchants were taken and, aff and affected with the bastinado, which is that their soles of their feet were turned upwards and they would be whipped on the bottoms of their soles the actions drew the consternation of not only Bepehoni, but also Taba Tabai and a number of other Mujtahids who were operating in the Iranian context. The Mujtahids uh, began protests not only in the bazaar, um, but throughout the country. Now, when the uh, Iranian police went after them, they used what is the traditional concept of best, in, in Persia, and best is this idea of religious sanctuary. If you retreat to a religious location, you are protected from violence. And so a lot of them went to the shrine of, of Shah Abdulazim to issue their demands um, against the Shah. And the demands were as follows. First, they wanted to remove the Tehran governor who had created this law and ordered the bastinado on, uh, on both of those sugar merchants. The next was that the Sharia, which was nominally the law of Iran, would actually come into force, right? The Mujtahids believe the Sharia is not just a set of specific laws and edicts, but they believe that it is the moral compass of the country, which is so perturbed now by all this Russian and British influence. They also wanted the end of the customs department and Naus to be dismissed because all of his taxes that led to um, these, uh, these price hikes in the uh, Iranian public square, and they wanted the creation of an Adal al or a house of justice, or a house of wisdom, depends on how you translate Adala. And this house of justice um, would be the forerunner of a parliament. Um, and this is the first time that you see the Mujtahids actually supporting the idea directly of a parliament, um, which was a very Western idea, a liberal idea. Um, there's a question of, is the bastinado um, more for humiliation or for pain? Um, the bastinado was actually not unique. Uh, we talked about the bastinado in episode 30 because it was implemented by Muhammad Ali in Egypt. Um, and it was a form of punishment that had been imported from Europe. Um, and it was designed because the bottom of the foot is weak and it's also humiliating to have a person upside down. So it does both. Um, and at the same time, it doesn't... Um, I'm trying to find the right word. It does, it, you don't run the risk of killing a person uh, through the bastinado, where you do run the risk of killing a person through whipping. So those uh, demands were made, but then the riots managed to, to soften up a bit in the end of 1905. Moving into 1906, Uh, there's a comment, um, religion plus two imperial powers exploiting the country. Um, 
yeah, uh, I like people sort of wonder why the Middle East is the way it is. And this is some of the reason. Um, so in 1906, there was another uh, riot um, that started in Tehran over similar issues. And this time, um, the Mujtahids and their students and a number of protesters retreated to the city of Qom. Uh, the city of Qom is uh, in the northwest of Iran, and it is a historic uh, center of Shiite Islam in Iran. It still is a center of Shiite Islam today. Um, and the Mujtahids reiterated their demands. Another group of them went to the British legation to Ghulhaq, saying that they should receive best there as well. And the British did uh, allow many of the nationalists and liberals who would not have felt at home in Qom to come to, uh, to Gholhaq and um, to stay there safe away from Persian attacks. Now, the nationalists and the liberals at Gholhaq began to disagree quite mightily over the direction that the country should take. But when it became increasingly clear that um, Muzaffar Adin Shah would not, um, uh, he removed the Tehran governor, he vowed to enforce the Sharia, he dismissed Naus, but the creation of the Adalat Khaneh took a lot more time. But finally, in December of 1906, he agreed to allow for the formation of the first Majlis, or the first parliament of Persia. And so you can see on the left-hand side, these are the representatives of the Majlis. And the Majlis was divided, generally speaking, between three different contingents. The moderate contingent, led by Bepehani, was the largest of those contingents. Smaller uh, were the liberal and royalist contingents, right? Liberals being more left-wing, more Europeanist, royalists being more conservative and more monarchist. The way that voting was constructed for the Majlis was an indirect system. There, uh, within the provinces, there were electors. These electors were individuals who happened to be landowners of medium or larger than medium sized properties, the ulama, the religious scholars and their students, and the merchants and the bazaar guilds. Those electors would then convene in regional assemblies and in those regional assemblies, they would vote on delegates and those delegates would be the members of the Majlis. Um, so you end up having this system where the interests of the merchants in the Bazaar Guild are overrepresented to a degree. Um, and there are a number of religious individuals like Bepehani, like Tabatabai, who are uh, part of the government. In fact, um, We'll, we'll discuss this, almost all of the major players um, in the government uh, established by the first Majlis are in one form or another Shiite religious leaders. Now, it's important to point out what the constitution did, and it was the constitution that allowed for uh, the creation of the Majlis among other reforms in Iran. The first one, and it's, and it's important to see how earth-shaking this was, the role of the Shah was actually defined. And the role of the Shah was defined as a person who is uh, empowered by the trust of the Iranian people, the Persian people, uh, for the defense of the Persian nation and serves at the will of the Persian people, right? This is a huge change um, in terms of the organization of Iran because previously for the entire history of the Iranian monarchy, which stretches back all the way to the days of the Medes and the Achaemenid Empire that we discussed in episode 37. Um, Iran has been an absolute monarchy with divine, um, with, with a, so a divine source of legitimacy. That legitimacy is now shifted to the Persian people. Um, and that means that the monarch is ultimately responsible to the people of Iran. The next um, piece is that Islam is recognized, Shiite Islam in particular, is recognized as the official religion under the constitution. And we begin to see certain characteristics of Islamic governance that we're going to see further along and are recognizable today. In particular, 
the judicial branch will be composed of a, of a committee of five ulama, and these five ulama would scrutinize the laws passed by the majlis in order to determine their Islamicness, their acceptability. In many ways, this looks very similar to the modern Guardian Council in Iran, which scrutinizes laws passed by the current majlis. <clears throat> also, the Shia Sharia will be enforced, that the rights um, understood by, by Sharia will become the dominant aspect of the law. That said, minorities like Jews, Armenians, Baha'i, Zoroastrians are all recognized as legitimate groups and they are given rights under the constitution in order to have representation. Now, that's not to say that everything went well. The, the, the one Jewish member of the Majlis um, was uh, attacked um, on numerous occasions and, um, and slurred, sorry, and received numerous anti-Semitic slurs during his time in office, which led to um, many of the Jews voting for Behbehoni as their representative. Because Behbehoni, despite being a Shiite, uh, a Shiite Marja, a Sayyid, um, he was um, operating in many cases um, for the benefit of the Jewish people um, in his negotiations with other um, Shiite leaders. And so the Jews felt that his representation was sufficient for them. Now, I sort of want to get more into the political dispute. So, right, you have, as I mentioned, and these three individuals, as I mentioned, um, most of the leading individuals in the part in the majlis were religious individuals of one stripe or another. And so I want to talk a little bit about these three. We've talked about Pepe Honey before. Um, Said Hassan Tarizadeh, uh, who you can see on, on the liberal side, he is a Sayyid, meaning that he's a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, or at least he claims that. Um, and his father, uh, Taki, uh, or Taghi, um, was himself a mullah. And Hassan um, went to um, Qom and studied to become a mullah himself, uh, obtaining the title um, before he learned European languages. After learning both French and English, he went to Western Europe and he studied all of the major European texts on governance. And he, and he found the European, that European style of leadership organization would be, he believed that would be exactly what Persia needed. It needed a constitution. It needed a system that kept religion uh, marginal, if at all present. And it needed a system that enforced equal rights for all people. Um, the Rizadeh um, was one of the more extreme thinkers, um, but he definitely had a small, uh, coalition behind him within, within the Majlis. On the other side, on the royalist faction, uh, we have Sheikh Fazlola Nuri. Um, and Nuri articulated in many ways um, the more conservative view um, in the Majlis. And that view was that the constitution was a Western artifact. By supporting a constitution, you were effectively ceding a lot of ground to the liberals because this was a liberal document in the sense of it was a document that they would have proposed. And so the constitution itself was tampering and limiting the Sharia, which should be the dominant power. It also limited the power of the Shah and the Shah should be the king. The Shah has historically been the king and that should continue. Furthermore, it is against both the Sharia and the history of Persia for the for the non-Muslim citizens of Iran to be seen as equal citizens. And if that doesn't sound familiar, it should, because we've seen similar arguments from the religious ulama in the Ottoman Empire when we had Ottomanism. Um, he also argued that many of the organizations within Iran that were being developed, such as the integration of the Cossacks into this new regime, um, such as uh, the increasing uh, police forces and others, uh, were Western concepts and organizations and would move Persia away from its historic influences and towards a more Western orientation, which would be injurious to the longevity of Persia. There's a question of whether these individuals are all, all religious. I don't know if Tarizadeh um, was religious. Um, Tarizadeh is sort of an interesting case. Um, because after he became a mullah, he never really um, took on a congregation. He never um, ascended to a higher level of jurisprudence. 
So I don't know if he was still religious. He may well have been atheistic or quasi-atheistic. But um, Said Abdullah Bepahani and Fazl al-Nuri were certainly religious. Um, and they were religious in the sense of they went to mosque um, at least once a week, if not more often. Um, they were individuals who were well-studied um, and they had their own uh, followings, right? We talked about, for example, when the Usulis prevailed over the Akhbaris, the Usulis said, you have to have Khojat al-Islam. The Khojat al-Islam will be superseded by the Ayat Allah. Um, all of these individuals are at those higher ranks. They're Khojat al-Islam or Ayat Allah. Um, and so their Islamic credentials are quite serious. So there's a question regarding nationalism and constitutions. In Anatolia, the Young Turks or CUP took over in 1908 after the revolution, reinstated the constitution and parliament. The Armenian genocide also occurred in 1915 with these Young Turks in power. Yes and no. Um, it is, you are correct that the Young Turks took power in the revolution of 1908. And you are correct that the CUP was in power in 1915. It's very important that we not confuse the Young Turks and the CUP. The, uh, the Young Turks refer to a number of different uh, groups of which the CUP is one. Um, so the Young Turks were in power in 1908. The CUP was not. And if you go back to episode 40, I talk about the, the counter-revolution, um, uh, which took place in 1909 when... Um, when Abdul, Med, uh, Abdul Hamid II tried to take back power, then the counter counter revolution, which put um, the Young Turks back in power. Then in 1912, uh, you had uh, the uh, Saviors Army, which took power from the CUP. Then the CUP was able to do in 1913, the counter coup against the Saviors Army due to the losses in the first Balkan war. And when the, they did that, they had the military behind them. And so the CUP with the military behind them was in power in 1913. It was, and it was a very different uh, political climate um, in 1915, uh, accordingly, than was the case in 1908. So um, I, I've simplified what took me about 30 minutes to explain in that presentation. So I'd encourage you uh, to go back there. So now starting in, um, Starting in the early 1900s, there was a cosmic and there was a seismic shift in European politics, and that seismic shift, of course, was the rise of Germany. And Germany changed a lot of the politics between Russia and Britain, because Germany was an effective land enemy to the Russians and an effective sea enemy to the British. And so the Russians and British felt that they should put behind themselves their historic conflicts, the Great Game, all of these kinds of things, and begin to move towards uh, an alliance. And so they signed the Anglo-Russian Convention of 1907, which partitioned Iran between them. You can see the northern part, including the city of Tehran, would fall into a formal Russian sphere of influence, and the southeastern part under a formal British sphere of influence. In fact, the British sphere of influence would eventually expand all the way to southwestern Iran, uh, even though it was never formalized as such. And the Russians uh, formally agreed that Afghanistan and China would be off limits to their expansion. We can see symbols of that rapprochement in addition to the way that they began to organize together for the control of Iran, um, that they were meeting, um, for example, in Tallinn, Estonia in 1908, um, which was part of the Russian empire. And that British-Russian alliance um, resulted in the Russians being able to take a more direct hand with the situation in the Majlis. The Russians were thoroughly opposed to any kind of constitutional government because that could give Russians in Russia um, an idea that such a government would be acceptable. So the Russians flexed what power they had. Um, the, the Persian Cossacks were still under the command of Russian commanders and had been um, throughout uh, the Majlis period. And so um, Vladimir Lyakhov, uh, who you can see there was the commander at the time and he met up with Shah Muhammad Ali who wanted to retake power. Um, he, Shah Muhammad Ali basically came to power just five days after the constitution was signed. Muzaffar ad-Din Shah died um, 
five days after he signed the constitution. So Shah Muhammad Ali came to power and he was an absolutist in intent. In fact, Fazlullah Nuri wanted to dissolve the Majlis, right? He was that royalist. He wanted to dissolve the Majlis and just give absolute power back to Shah Muhammad Ali because Muhammad Ali was asking for it. Um, so now Yaqob and Muhammad Ali work together um, in order to get the Cossacks to attack the parliament. And that's exactly what happened. So uh, you can see on the right hand side, this is a picture of the Majlis after it was shelled by Russian forces. Oh, uh, sorry, by, by the Cossacks at Russian direction. And many of the members of the Majlis, like Tariq Zadeh, like, uh, yeah, like Tariq Zadeh, like Tawa Tabai, um, either fled or uh, summarily uh, lost power. And a number of other liberals and moderates, moderates, of course, being in support of the constitution as Islamic modernists, um, were arrested. Um, and, uh, and this was for a year, a successful counter revolution. But in 1909, um, the, the tide had turned. So Muhammad, uh, Muhammad Ali Shah um, told his, uh, um, his chief of military command, Muhammad Wali Khan uh, Tonekaboni, who you can see in the middle, he told him to go and uh, move into the west, the northwestern part, um, the region of Iranian Azerbaijan, um, because the most concentrated constitutionalist resistance following the bombardment of parliament was in that region. Uh, and it was led by two individuals, Bagher Khan and Satir Khan, who you can see seated there. But uh, Tone Kabouni um, completely changed the, uh, the future of Iran when he decided he would not follow the order. And in fact, he met up with Bagher Khan and Satar Khan and proposed an alliance with them. Um, they then in turn got an alliance, uh, uh, expanded their alliance by moving into Kerman Shah and meeting up with the Bakhtiari tribe. If you, uh, if you remember the Bakhtiaris were key um, in uh, Karim Khan of the Zand uh, taking power in the late 18th century. And this Bakhtiari tribe uh, would again be key in uh, augmenting uh, Tone Kabouni's army. So um, Tone Kabouni and Satir Khan marched together. You can actually see them uh, in the left hand, uh, in the center, marching on the palace in Tehran. Um, and they, uh, they forced Muhammad Ali Shah to flee. He fled first to the Russian legation and then was brought uh, back to Riyadh, uh, to, to Russia, sorry. Lyakhov was also arrested. Um, and then he was supposed to be executed, but fearing Russian recriminations, uh, he was sent back to Russia instead. The Persian Cossacks came under the direct control of um, Tonai Kabouni, who was recognized as the, Sar as the Sarbadar, um, or the chief military uh, leader, commander-in-chief, you could call it, of the, of the Persian Republic. And, uh, sorry, of the Persian, of the Persian uh, Qajar Empire. And... Um, the Majlis took front and center stage once again. One of the interesting things is that King, uh, the last Qajar King Ahmed, was crowned at this point. But I don't even I don't even put a picture of him up here because he is so uninvolved in politics. Iran is effectively a republic um, in all but name. The the Qajar Shah um, uh, lost power after this return in triumph to Tehran in July of 1909. Now, the amount of disorder that resulted from the reconvening parliament um, cannot be overstated. The first thing that needs to be put into perspective is that many of the moderates now dug in their heels on either side. And so you had a very entrenched liberal and a very entrenched con uh, royalist conservative um, parliament that was much more at odds with one another. Many of the modernists um, were increasingly anti-liberal, uh, anti um, and so the liberals would have a much harder time governing than they ever, had ever had before. Another issue is that many Iranians considered the confusion that resulted from the 1908, uh, the 1906 uh, revolution, the 1908 uh, counter revolution, the 1909 counter counter revolution, um, all of this to be the work 
of conspiracies led by Jews, uh, Armenians, Baha'i, and Zoroastrians. Um, and in fact, many of the royalists who were more conservative uh, placed more blame on these minorities than is actually warranted, which resulted in numerous pogroms against those communities. The Jews were particularly hard hit. Um, those are Jews from the city of Kerman Shah, which, uh, which was attacked by a pogrom in 1909. There was another pogrom in, 1900, in 1910 as well in Isfahan. One of the interesting things that happens after the triumph of Tehran is that the Majlis begins to um, create a strong Iranian national government. And the way that they do this is through their relationship with the United States. So the United States at this point has had minimal involvement uh, with the Middle East. And um, Iranians reached out to them for assistance, uh, reached out to them for assistance with many of the financial organizations of the country. In response, the US recommended uh, uh, Morgan Schuster, W. Morgan Schuster, um, and he became the uh, effectively the treasurer um, of uh, Qajar Iran, uh, despite being an American, uh, and he was appointed to that command. In many ways, um, Morgan Schuster represented what America was to the Persians at this point, right? America was a westernized state. Uh, but it was a westernized state that was willing to deal with Iran as an equal partner, um, was willing to treat with Iran um, on Iran's own terms. And so America received an incredible amount of respect, both in general and specifically because of what Schuster did. And so what did he do? He balanced a lot of the fiscal budgets. He expanded the tax, uh, right, uh, the tax bureaucracy by uh, expanding the Persian gendarmerie, who would be responsible for collecting the taxes. He also uh, was responsible for organizing uh, debt repayments and putting uh, Persia on the road to financial recovery from the previous uh, less than stellar policies. The Russians, however, were not excited about an independent, organized and developed Iran. And so they launched an invasion starting in 1911 uh, to overthrow um, overthrow the Majlis and restore a more authoritarian uh, government. In this case, they were not going to entrust that government to the Qajar Shah, they were going to entrust it to their own occupying army. And in fact, the Russian army would remain in Iran until the mid 1940s. Now, you can see in the lower right hand side when the Russians reached the city of Tabriz, which is, uh, which is relatively close to um, the border with Azerbaijan. It's, it's the capital of Iranian Azerbaijan. Um, many constitutionalists were hanged um, and they were hanged in order to send the message that uh, constitutionalism would no longer be accepted under Russian control. Schuster himself was expelled. He was, he was as an American, uh, he wouldn't be attacked or jailed by the Russians, but he was expelled from the country by the Russians. And he wrote in his book, The Strangling of Persia, um, his belief that the Persians were an incredible people that he had worked so hard to help um, and who genuinely respected what he was able to contribute. In fact, the first time the Russians had demanded that he be fired, women stormed, stormed the Majlis demanding that Schuster not be fired and the Majlis confirmed to them that they had no intention of relieving him of his duties uh, considering how well he had advised Persia um, on monetary aspects. Uh, there's a question as to what the British were doing at this time. The British were consolidating their control in the southern part of the country. So um, they were they were willing to let the Russians take the lead on opposing uh, Morgan Schuster. But they were certainly not amenable uh, to what he was doing, and they considered uh, any action toward Iranian resilience an action against their interest. The view of America that Schuster implanted uh, would only be... A, expanded by Woodrow Wilson. And Woodrow Wilson's idea of self-determination um, was particularly, um, was 
was particularly well seen by Persians because it, re it represented the idea that the Persians should be able to define their own future and not be at the whim of the Russians or the British. Be, uh, in many ways, the pro-American expectations that were developed uh, in the early part of the 20th century were what led to such um, a disappointment in many Iranian circles when the United States uh, in, uh, got involved in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s in manipulating Iranian policy then. So sort of responding to the question, what was the British influence? So the British influence was really to uh, coordinate and organize the Anglo uh, Petroleum uh, Oil Company, right, APOC. And to this end, they were building uh, the refineries. Remember the Abadan refinery was finished in 1911. They also worked with Burma Oil to create the British Tanker Company, which would uh, begin to take starting in 1915, oil from the south of Iran to the British, um, which could not have come sooner for them because of, um, because of World War I. Russian influence also started to decline um, in Iran following the 1911 counter-revolution because of an, a Russian shelling of Imam Reza shrine in Mashhad. Now, this event occurred only a few days uh, before the Titanic um, had its fateful uh, collision with an iceberg. Um, and so it didn't stay in the international news for very long, but in Persia, um, the violation of best spiritual sanctuary by the Russians um, got uh, Persians, uh, created a lot of antipathy uh, towards the Russians and instigated a lot of local revolts. In particular, you had the Jangal, um, the Jangal um, comes from the English word jungle, um, and, and which is uh, in, which is the same in the Persian Jangal, and it refers to the woods uh, in northwestern Iran near the region of Gilan. Kuchuk Khan led his Jangalis, um, who were a mercenary corps, um, throughout the region and were able to keep uh, Russian influence confined primarily to Tehran. Even the British who would later fight the Jangalis in 1918 um, under the command of Lionel Dunsterville um, admitted that um, he had underestimated the Jangalis to his own detriment and it was they who controlled the mountains and the forests. So we often don't talk about the Persian campaign and I'm gonna spend a little more time on it when we get to World War I campaigns um, in, uh, on the 21st of July, but some points to make here. Persia was nominally neutral um, in the war. Despite that, of course, Russia and Britain were not neutral in the Great War, neither was the Ottoman Empire, which meant that Persia's borders were surrounded by enemies. Now, the first enemy to violate uh, Persian autonomy, um, of course, were the British and the Russians because they were already there. But in terms of actual war aims uh, that differed from the traditional occupation, it was the Ottoman Empire. And the issue here is that there were a number of Armenian and Assyrian settlements on the Persian side of the border. You can see on the map, uh, those red dots represent Assyrian settlements. Um, Assyrians and Armenians were both targeted uh, by Ottoman forces in the, uh, in the genocides. And so there was a lot of cross-border raiding. There was also um, the creation of a quasi-Kurdish controlled region led by uh, Simko Shahak. Uh, we're gonna talk about that again um, in, in three weeks. And so you have this Ottoman incursion uh, into Persia. This also aligned with the German attempts. If you remember from uh, episode 40, we talked about how the Germans were building the Berlin-Baghdad railway in order to facilitate the German conquest of India. Of course, the next stage in that would be the taking of Iran. And so you have uh, Wilhelm Vasmus, uh, you can see him in the center. And Wilhelm Vasmus is often called uh, the Lawrence of Persia um, as a joking nod to the Lawrence of Arabia in that he was able to create strong alliances with a number of Persian tribes in the regions of Kerman Shah, um, Luristan, um, in Bakhtiari uh, and in Aboyer Ahmad. Uh, 
which if you look on the map are towards the southwestern regions of Iran, exactly where um, British uh, oil interests are. The, in order to counter this, the British created their own militia. You can see General Sykes from the famous Sykes-Picot uh, agreement in 1917, that's General Sykes of the British Army, and he's there with a number of Qashqai. The Qashqai are a Turkey people that live in Iran, and these were recruited along with a number of other local populations into what were called the South Persia Rifles um, in order to do battle with uh, the German organized uh, local troops as well. World War I was incredibly damaging um, to Iran, despite the fact that these campaigns and wars were relatively low level. And the reason for that is, is because of Persia's tie into Russia. So when the Russian Revolution happened in 1917, it effectively cut off Iran from about 60, 67% of its trade um, because Iran traded that extensively with Russia. And that led to massive equipment shortfalls, food shortfalls, um, and other um, necessities of life not arriving to the Iranian people. That combined with the destruction of Persian territory led to a famine between 1917 and 1919. There are debates as to how many Persians died, um, and a lot of that has to do with bad population estimates for the beginning of the 20th century in Iran. At a minimum, 1.5 million people died. Um, some estimate even as high as 6 million, although those numbers are heavily criticized. And World War I, because of the famine, because of all these issues, demonstrated quite clearly that the Qajar system uh, and the occupation by these um, powerful uh, Western militaries would no longer be viable for Iran. And Iran really had to find a new way um, to become a nation. So despite the fact that the British after the war reached out to Persia, um, now that the Russians were too weak to expand their influence, right, the Soviets were too busy coordinating control of their own territory, the British tried to create an alliance similar to what they had done in 1813. But um, a young commander within the Persian Cossacks uh, named Reza Khan, um, who you can see here with a number of other Cossack officers, uh, refused the British and instead launched a coup d'etat uh, to take control of the country for himself. And that will start the Pahlavi dynasty that we will cover in several, in, in probably in about a month or a month and a half. Questions, comments, concerns? All right, so while, while I'm waiting for a few questions to come in, um, as I said uh, before we started, next week we are not presenting. Uh, I'm taking a week off to move. That's why you can see there's no books behind me. It's not that I suddenly became uh, incapable of reading. Um, and that uh, in uh, two weeks will be a discussion of Ottoman internal policy, um, specifically the Armenian, Assyrian, Pontic Greek genocides, and the Great Famine of Mount Lebanon, uh, in addition to other internal Ottoman issues during World War I. Then on the 21st of July, we will talk about the military aspect of World War I in the Middle East. Um, just as a pointer, that's only going to be about the Middle East. If you're expecting to hear about the Battle of the Somme and the Battle of Verdun and um, other battles on the Western Front, it's going to be all quiet. So um, we're only going to talk about the Middle East. And trust me, there's more than enough campaigns, more than enough issues to talk about. And then following that on the 28th, we are going to talk about the Turkish War of Independence, which is what happens after the armistice at Mudros uh, in 1918 to uh, the creation of the Turkish Republic in 1923. Now, one, uh, one other thing is that uh, on the 10th of uh, July, uh, we are going to do our next in the European Union series covering uh, the early aughts. Uh, in uh, European Union defense and security, and I'm hosting that jointly with Aaron uh, this uh, on Sunday the 10th. And of course, come see all of our other uh, lectures and series. Um, we're all doing fabulous 
uh, work. All right. So there's a question of um, how did the First World War cause these disasters in Persia the moment that they get the Russians and the Brit uh, get off the Russians and the British? Well, they didn't get off the British, right? The British managed to maintain their power within Iran during World War I, um, and they only lose it in 1921 when Reza Khan um, leads that insurrection. So the British were still there. Um, the Russians withdrew in 1917 because of the Russian Revolution, but the Russian Revolution meant that trade effectively stopped between Russia and Iran. And as we mentioned earlier, Iran didn't have the ability to modernize because all those modernized textiles, uh, foods, uh, other imports um, were just too expensive to be made within Iran itself when competing with all those foreign imports. So um, the loss of all that incoming, uh, incoming um, shipments uh, led to uh, massive shortfalls across Iran. That then combined with the fact that the years 1917 to 1919 were not terribly good in Iran. The weather didn't work out very well. And agronomic techniques in Iran were not very good. And there was war in about half the country um, between those German-aligned tribes and the British-aligned tribes and the Kurds uh, continually doing those cross-border raids into northwest Iran that you had exactly the conditions you need for a famine. And that's what happened. Um, there's a trivia point here. Uh, the treaty ending the Russo-Japanese uh, war was negotiated in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. That's absolutely true. Um, it was uh, it was negotiated by Teddy Roosevelt specifically because America was trying to expand its role uh, as an international arbiter and could be seen as neutral by both the Japanese and the Russians. Unless there's anything further, um, I'll see everybody in the in two weeks, if not sooner. All right. And thank you everybody for all the kind words.